Panzer is an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics at Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian Kamansky Children's Hospital. She has recently joined New York Presbyterian Brooklyn Methodist Hospital as well. She's board certified in pediatric pulmonology, sleep medicine, and general pediatrics. Dr. Gora Panzer received her medical education at the University of Hamburg in Germany and completed her residency in pediatrics and her fellowship in pediatric pulmonology at SUNY Down State Medical Center. After working at the Children's Hospital of Montefiore as a director of technology, of the Technology Dependent Center for Children and the co-director of the Children's Sleep Disorder Center, she joined Weill Cornell Medicine, where she is the program director of the Pediatric Pulmonology Fellowship Program and the director of Aerodigestive Center of Bronchoscopy. She has extensive experience and interest in the evaluation and treatment of children with upper and lower airway dysfunction, aerodigestive disorders, complex medical disorders, and sleep disorders. Here today to talk about building healthy sleep habits, please welcome Dr. Panzer. Thank you very much, Lauren, and thank you, Parkstop parents, for having me today to talk to you about sleep. And um, I mean, that's a topic which is dear to all of us. Um, and um, I'm an expert by profession, but I was a parent or I am a parent, so I had my own uh, personal experiences with that. So I'm happy to share uh, what, what, uh, what I know and what I learned. Um, I'm happy to be back in Brooklyn. Um, I used to, I started my my time in New York in, when I lived in Park Slope, so I'm always very fond to go back. Uh, now we're going to Brooklyn, I'm happy to go back to Park Slope and um, be joined uh, in the, into this neighborhood. Okay, so I will talk about uh, creating healthy sleep habits, um, and I would like to start uh, off with a um, with a patient I saw recently, um, a, a kid who a mother who came to the clinic. One second. Okay. So first, what we I will talk about um, this the uh, child who saw me in the clinic. Um, we'll talk a bit a little bit about what are the most common sleep concerns and what how they arise. Um, little sleep principles. Or how how what is important to know about sleep to understand about sleep to see how we can manage and help our children to sleep better. Um, and also talk about how much sleep we should try to um, children should get. So the most common concern is really um, that parents are having is that the child wakes up at night a lot. Um, so a mom, mom I saw recently she told me that her child, her 10 year old uh, daughter, she wakes up at night and she cannot sleep through the night. Um, she used to have no problems. She started sleeping through the night at five months of age. And, but then however, a few months later at eight months of age, she started waking up. So she wakes up every two to four hours. Bedtime problems and night wakings, they're really common in young children. Um, certain, you know, different numbers are there, but 30% of infant and toddlers preschooler have sleep problems, but so like a third of children do have problems. So this is why it's really important um, to ad address this. Um, when children have trouble sleeping at night, what it leads to is a shorter sleep time overall. And that, as we know, if children don't sleep well, they are very more irritable in the daytime, have temper, temper tantrums and behavior problems. Um, as adults, when we don't sleep enough, we are sleepy, but children, on the other hand, they get much more hyperactive. And that impairs the academic, neurobehavioral, and emotional function in children as adults. Um, but the effects are not just on the children, it also affects us as, us as parents uh, because we are deprived of sleep. When I see a child for uh, sleep problems, I go through a whole routine of sleep questions to understand what, um, where, where, where are things, where, what, what could be helped. So in this little child now, I go through the routine um, with the parent and they have dinner at five, um, take a bath, 5.45, story time and PJ. So this is a great nighttime routine. Um, then the child usually asks for milk and mom nurses the child or dad gives the bottle. Um, usually when she sees mom, she really wants her to be there and nurse her for comfort as well. Um, while the child is drinking the bottle of milk, she's dozing off, um, is sleepy and, and falling asleep. Then usually dad sits with her and sings at a crib until she's deeply asleep. Um, and then he will 
he dad will place or um, uh, will place the baby to the bed. So this bedtime routine is is um, some things might sound familiar. This is what what's happening. So uh, they're they're very good things, um, and then also things of concerns. Later on at night. The child wakes up around 10 o'clock and is awake and happy to see the parents, wants to play, wants to talk to them. I mean, 10 month old, sorry, but wants to interact with the family. Um, usually dad goes to her, calms her off, and she falls asleep again on his chest. Um, however, if this is not done, then she might just cry for hours. Um, once a child is asleep, this repeats two, three hours later. The child gets up at seven o'clock and the child takes two naps in the daytime. Other things important for sleep are, of course, the environment. Um, is there enough space? Is the child by himself? So the child does sleep in her own crib um, as recommended and is in her own room. Different techniques the child might have learned. Um, so she is able to self-soothe. She uses a pacifier, but she cries if that would get lost. Um, otherwise, the child is a normal developing child, has no snoring, no sleep apnea, no breathing problems at night. So. As you can see, I have a lot of information now about this child's sleep and um, reactions from the parents and what, what, what are good behaviors, what are behaviors we want to address. I will continue with the case in a moment, but like just looking back um, at our sleep, I want to go through some basics, um, how, how I understand sleep. Um, we know that when a child goes to bed, um, you go through different stages. Um, first, there's a brief moment of awake, the child falls asleep and goes into deep sleep. Um, the stage three sleep is the very the deep sleep where you recover, you get your energy back. Um, then after a while, um, this transitions to REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. That's the time where we dream a lot, um, where the child are also a little bit, have a little more shallow breathing. And out of this REM, it's very easy to have a light arousal because the sleep is much slighter. So there might be an arousal. Um, the child goes back to sleep and this repeats over the night. These are the sleep cycles we see. So arousals are normal. They occur a few times a night, um, especially out of REM sleep. What we might do uh, if it, or a person who is able to fall back asleep, usually you just turn around and go back to sleep and it's not a problem. But in children who have um, trouble falling asleep by themselves, each arousal leads to an awakening. So this would be now a child, um, looking at now a child with an arousal disorder. So what happens, the child lies down with the parent, it takes a long time to fall asleep. They go into the deep sleep and then two, three hours later, like an hour child, the child wakes up. Um, after the child goes back to sleep, each time the child arouses, it wakes up. So each time there is this waking up, not able to go to sleep, and this repetition of this, this behavior, which is really, um, which is, which is um, difficult. So how I see it or how this is seen is that falling asleep is a skill, um, falling asleep without a parental help. Um, like we teach a child to go to train for the potty or, um, or ride a bike, um, falling asleep without help is also a, a skill to be learned. And at the end of the time, uh, end of the day, it's really helpful for the child to learn it. Um, there are different sleep onset associations um, where what the child associates with sleep. So one which is typical or often done is rocking a child to sleep, uh, being on the arm, being on the lap. Um, this is one association which is which we is a should be avoided. Another association is milk. Um, it's difficult because we encourage nursing and oftentimes the child gets sleepy while nursing and falls asleep. Um, the same happens with her being on a bottle or being dependent on that. Another common, very desperate, or some children uh, need that is like really to be motivated uh, being in a car or being driven. That's what they associate with falling asleep. So these are examples of sleep onset associations where you need an outside stimulus for the child to fall asleep. So the child cannot do it by themselves. They need somebody else. They need parental support. They need milk to fall asleep. And if this is, a, if this is what they need, 
to go to sleep, they need it every time at night again when they wake up out of sleep. So self-soothing is a skill which we want to teach uh, our uh, ch children. It's usually, it, it happens early, it um, can develop between three and six months of age uh, in normal developing healthy children. So um, we, I will go over certain things, um, how we can reinforce self-soothing behavior, how we can help to create that um, to help the child sleep through the night. Um, another sleep problem we sometimes see is, uh, is what we call the limit setting side. So the child is, we want to bring the child to bed and um, after a while they come back and they want one more story, they want one more kiss, they want one more a good sip of water. So that's what we call behavior insomnia of childhood limit setting type. So they are there are behaviors the child is um, exhibiting to and wants the parent's attention basically before they fall asleep. This type of behavioral insomnia, however, uh, once the child is asleep, they sleep well. So it's different than the other ones. The uh, one I talked before, sleep onset association here, this is more the limit setting type. They are, they are categorized as two different distinct disorders. However, most of the time there is an overlap um, that a child might want to have a parent with them to fall asleep um, and also want you know, another story and uh, another kiss. Um, but then they're used to fall asleep with the parent and when they wake up at night, they need it again. So in this case, you have, uh, have multiple, multiple things occurring. So, how it's being treated is most with behavioral therapy. Um, I think these are the certain strategies. The most important uh, one is really being consistent in, in the behavior during the daily routines and also in our response to the child's behavior. So my goal is really to find a way how, how, we, how this can be done um, with a family, with both parents, um, what are the um, you know, what are both parents' ideas and limits, how, what do you feel comfortable with to do? Um, so, but consistency is, is the key um, to find one way you can continue with, with. What's problem is with um, intermittent. So when the parents or we respond in different ways and each time um, it's, it's called an intermittent, uh, Oops, sorry. I'm sorry, but if there is an inconsistent response from us as parents, the children have difficulties to know when their behavior will be rewarded or not. The example is done here with a slot machine where you don't know when you get the reward, but you know at some point you will get it. So if the child, for example, asks for attention and we um, don't respond for two or three times, but then the fifth time we respond, the child will learn to just repeat that. So this is really difficult to um, extinguish. So once the child has learned that the parent might react at some point, um, they, that, that behavior will be re perpetuate versus if we are consistent and stay, stick with one, the child eventually will learn how we will react. And children do, they want that security and safety on, of our response, even though it, it, it's a little bit hard to, um, to convey initially. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is what, what is um, the best, best way to help children um, to fall asleep. So that was a lot of theory, but I, now let me change over to some recommendations, what, what can be done. Um, the recommended bedtime for children is really 7 to 7.30 p.m. Um, and that's seven days a week. I know that you know, sometimes there are weekends, there are different routines, but however, again, consistency is the best and the sleep time should be early enough to really allow the child to have a long time of sleep. Sometimes the bedtime can get later because um, parents feel like, oh, let the child get a little more sleepier and it might be easier than to, for them to fall asleep. Oftentimes, however, in children who have trouble sleeping, it's the opposite. The sleepier children get, the more difficult is it to, for them to fall asleep. This is a chart. Um, which shows us the different hours of sleep a child will get. I will lead you through it a little bit. Initially, you have like a one week old child who sleeps 
a lot. Uh, sleep 16 hours in a 24 hour time. Um, eight of it is at night and then there are four naps a day. Over time, we can see the white part, the naps decrease um, and the nighttime sleep increases proportionally. By usually three four, age of, three, four years of age, the child doesn't need a nap anymore and the night sleep is consolidated through the night. These are different hours of sleep we recommend. Um, when the children are below one year of age, they should sleep 12 to 16 hours. That includes nap time. Um, children one to two years of age, they should sleep 11 to 14 hours. That also includes the naps. And three to five, 10 to 13 hours, including naps. So there is an, what I also want to point out, there is a, an array, right? 12 to 4, 16 hours or 11 to 14 hours. So not every child is the same. Uh, some children need a little bit more sleep, some need less sleep. I think the clue is really like, how is the quality and how are the children during the day? A very nice way to help children organize their day and the night uh, is a nighttime chart. Um, so a nighttime chart helps kids to know what to expect. So we recommend a standardized bedtime routine. It should be the same every night. It should be brief, uh, 20 to 30 minutes. It shouldn't extend to one and a half hours. So it should be a regular routine, 20 to 30 minutes with a few activities, two or three. And to help the child understand what to expect is um, one way is like this bedtime routine chart. There are different examples where the child has an expectation like dinner, take a bath, put on pajamas, brush your teeth, read a book, go to sleep. And whenever they accomplish one task there, that can be um, uh, you know, flipped over the, the, the card or it could be added to a, um, a sticker could be added or different ways can be done. So this can be changed according to the child. If the child is younger, um, the parents can tell what to do. If the child is older, there can be a little bit discussion you know, what, what do we agree on? Do you want um, two, two stories? Do you want one story and one song? Do you want one story and a prayer? So every family can kind of determine themselves what to do. But by this visual help, children really know what to expect. And, um, and then the parent can say, if the child asks for another story, they can say, no, we are, this chart is full. The recommendation is also to move all the activities into the child's environment, into the bedroom. So the child knows that it's a sleepy time, it's nighttime, we are in the bedroom now. Important for a child to fall asleep is really to be in their crib or in their bed when they are um, still awake. Um, Sometimes um, when the children are getting a bottle or are being nursed or a story is read, they're already falling asleep and dozing off. That's not so good. It really, the child is, it's better to put the child in the bed when they're still awake. So they are awake in the bed when they are trying to fall asleep and learn that this, the crib is where they have to fall asleep. With, that's their association. I mean, what happens then is it <laughs> depends. You know, every child is different. Um, if you did everything in the beginning and then you leave the room and the child cries, there are different methods. I'm, I'm sure everyone is familiar with all the different methods out there in terms of um, what we recommend. There is standard extinction where the parent leaves the room and lets the child cry and no response until the next morning. Then there's graduated extinction um, where you don't just leave, you might check in uh, every few minutes to, so, to see how the child is doing and reassure the child and leave again. Um, both of these methods are very, very helpful. Um, standard extinction, just leaving the room is faster, but it's sometimes harder for families to do. Um, graduated extinction is, takes longer time, um, but it's also working really well. Another approach is, for example, fading with a parental presence. What that means is that the child, the parent is still in the room. Um, but the parent um, doesn't interact with the child, doesn't touch or doesn't talk to him, but is just there. So there are different you know, approaches. I think I uh, don't want to go into details and I'm sure everybody's familiar and I'm happy to answer questions regarding that later. Um, a very nice way to, um, to interact with the child at night is um, to have like a short little phrase we use because 
children are looking for the attention of their parent. Um, but when anything we give them, being like singing a song, reading a story is a positive attention. Or even when we get upset, um, this is also some kind of attention. So to kind of take this away, you just wanna say, use a little sentence like, see you in the morning, it's nighttime now, see you tomorrow, and that's it. Like, like a little brief sentence you feel comfortable with and where um, you are able to say something to your child, um, but you don't have to interact with the child in another way. You just say your little sentence and leave again. So the idea is to reassure the child, but not to interact further with, with the child. Yeah, so I think these were some ideas. Um, there are a lot of recommendations out there also um, about childhood behavioral insomnia of childhood, um, but I'm happy to answer um, any questions at this point. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Panzer. I know we have a couple of questions. Um, and one of the things about this, uh, one of the things about this, the, uh, my kid didn't sleep through the night until she was 23 months, okay? <laughs> so I'm just gonna put that out there. And when she was young, there was definitely this discussion of if you, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this. If we let them cry it out, then they're gonna have attachment issues. And then the other side was, you can find a book that says you're doing it wrong no matter what, right? And then the other side was, if you don't let them cry it out and they don't sleep enough, you're going to ruin their brain. So I guess I'd love to know from, from your side what it is that you feel if people are like, but I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna mess them up. How do I not mess them up? No. Yeah, no, I understand because that's um, there are many feelings involved with um, falling asleep. Also, as a parent, when you, you know, let's say you're working and you come home, you finally have time with your child. You don't, you know, you want to enjoy that time. Um, I mean, in general, you don't, you don't do anything wrong by letting the child cry because I think the idea is to teach a child a skill. And um, even if it might be a little bit hard to get there, it's not that there will be harm. So I think this was really extensively studied that the cry it out doesn't cause harm on the child. It does depends more on what, what are we as parents comfortable with? Um, what are we able to tolerate? And I think this is some discussion. There is not one way fits all. Um, I think it depends on the family, on the child, on the behavior, what works well. And I think that's the idea to come up with a treatment plan or a treatment sounds um, with a plan, nighttime plan, which works for everybody, like both parents um, uh, and, and, uh, and yeah. And then I guess the other, the other question I would have, and I love that you brought up the idea of the emotion that comes in it. You know, we have this newborn and we don't want to harm this newborn. And sometimes it feels a little bit like, well, if they're crying, it means I'm not a good parent and those kinds of things. And I would, I would love to know how you handle if one parent is totally on board with, you know, crying it out and the other parent isn't. What can, what can partners do together to kind of get through this? Because that could just be one little wedge to say we have a difference in our parenting style and you want me to let this poor little innocent baby cry it out. Okay, so any yeah. thought, thoughts yeah. about that? Yeah, I understand that, that that can be difficult. I think one is, is good to educate both parents that um, what cry it out does and that there is no harm on the child, um, that you at the end of the day, you're teaching a skill. Um, I think it's helpful to um, help the parent who is against one way or the other to educate and to understand and then to find a way um, what works for both. I think that's important because let's say one night, one parent does one, um, one way and then next night something else is done, this doesn't go anywhere. So I think it's more important to find a way which works well for both parents um, and then work with that. Um, other point is also important that each parent has to support the other one. It's, um, I think it doesn't go the other way, right? If, if you wanna do the cry it out and the parent is stressed, you need the parent needs the support from their partner. 
to, to do that. Um, so I think that's, that's um, important that everybody's on the same page and to find a way. I mean, there are tweaks you can do, but the idea, the under, important understanding is that it's not harmful, um, but yeah. Are you muted? It, it's not a real webinar unless I forget to mute, mute at some point, um, <laughs> unmute. Um, is there any sense that there's something genetically related to sleep? Like my brother's kids, they can't, they can't fall asleep until like three and they're in their twenties, but they, they have a, a clock that like, you don't wake up until two o'clock in the afternoon and they can't go to sleep. It's like some kind of, and, and two of them have it. Is there a genetic component to sleep and sleep disorders? So, um, yes, um, there are certain sleep disorders which are which have a genetic predisposition, but um, it's not that strong that there's one gene or, or something like that. It is more like a um, like you have one child who is a good sleeper and the next child is not. The sibling is not. Where you're wondering like, oh, is so it's not it's not the parent necessarily. It is um, that each child has a different temperament and behavior. So I think with this limit setting type and sleep onset association, it's more the temperament of the child and how as a parent we are consistent, um, which might also change from one child to the other and depending on how we are challenged. Yeah. Um, I think we should go ahead and turn to some of the questions. Rachel, did you wanna handle those? Do you want me to handle those? Sure, yeah. It looks like we have a handful of questions in both the question and answer and the chat. So I would just remind anybody who has a question to please put it in the question and answer. Um, we have uh, a lot of questions coming in already. So um, the first question comes from Nadia and um, they ask, I thought sleep associations are okay in the first 12 weeks. Is this true? So can you repeat that again? I thought sleep associations are okay in the first 12 weeks. Is it true? Okay, so the first 12 weeks would be um, the first four months. So it's different, yes. So the self-soothing starts at three to six months. So technically the first few, uh, first few weeks are not included in that, yes. And it depends on which, which association you wanna foster. So of course, if the child, a baby, a newborn is nursing on the breast falling asleep, that's completely okay, um, that's fine. Uh, it's just at this at a point when they get older, four, five, six months, where you want to kind of start introducing, uh, you know, dissociation um, to not associate, sorry, the sleep onset with nursing or with rocking. Um, I have to bring up, uh, and you may know this, uh, Dr. Panzer, but you may know this, but there's a uh, a pediatrician uh, uh, pediatrician's office, and they have many, many uh, different. Uh, different offices, I think they have 20 offices and they send out and somebody on the, the group can send out uh, to can, can uh, chat us what week you got it. I think it's at eight weeks, but they say, it's time to sleep train your kid. Here's how to do it, eight weeks. So if you're going to phase that out, and this also goes along with the question that you just answered, sleep associations are okay. W at what week do you start phasing those out and can, do you feel comfortable actually sleep training? Is it 12 weeks? Is it eight weeks? What do you yeah. think? Yeah, I mean, you, you can start at two or three months. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, but again, then every child is a little bit different. Every family is different. But I think the idea is the the earlier you do it, it's easier. Um, and a toddler is, is much more difficult to sleep train. Um, and we know even though you start early, then there might be phases where there's a little challenge again, where the child is teething or has a cold or you travel. So there might be little setbacks, but I think if you start with the skills early on um, and have the concept of what you can do, it's helpful because it, um, it, it, it sets the right, you know, you, you start off on the right foot, <laughs> so to say. To that end, we have a question from Sarah in the chat. And Sarah asked, any advice for phasing out a pacifier for naps and nap time? Um, she okay. says they're 20 to two month old sleeps through the night, but won't give it up. So what do you do at that phase? Okay. So in terms of sleep, um, a pacifier is uh, actually a self-soothing skill, which is uh, accepted. 
I know in terms of development of the teeth and the gums, um, it's at some point not advised anymore. Um, but in terms of falling asleep, um, that's, that, that's okay. <laughs> I, I don't know, I cannot talk about recommendation to remove the, the pacifier, I'm sorry. Um, I just know that in terms of sleep, it's something which we don't discourage, but at some point, yes, it should be weaned. Yeah. Uh, Parksville Parents has an article on our website and I'm putting up the, uh, it's had a, giving up the pacifier. And I guess in some foreign countries, there's a pacifier tree I don't think they'll let us do it in Prospect Park, but you literally say, you know, you're a big, you're a big boy now, you're a big girl now, and you go and take your pacifier and hang it on a oh, yeah, specific yeah. tree in the square. And yeah. there's other ones. So you feel like, oh, I'm a big kid, I'm giving up my pacifier. But there's lots of other ideas too. So I'll put that in the chat about a pacifier. Go ahead, Rachel. Sorry. Sure. Um, I see a question um, from an anonymous attendee. When do you recommend babies start sleeping in their own room? Okay. Um, so the first weeks and months, we like the recommendations in terms of um, are that the child sleeps in a, on a separate sleep surface, meaning a crib or a bassinet, next in the parent bedroom. So they are um, attended in a way, but they're not at risk. Uh, at, and then at six months, one year of age, even uh, then move out into their own room. Um, so these are the recommendations. Um, I know my second child, he was just too noisy and we couldn't sleep and we moved him out much earlier. Um, so I think, again, um, the, the risk of SIDS is the highest is two to six months of age. So I think if the child is six, eight months, then, then one can consider changing the bedroom. Moira asks, um, my daughter is five months old and we currently have nursing as part of our bedtime routine. At what point do you recommend removing feeding as part of the routine? Okay. Um, at six, eight months of age, children tend not to need a nighttime feeding anymore and you can just try to move it a little earlier. Um, I think what, what can be done is to nurse, but then afterwards have something else, um, a song or so, uh, another activity which comes after the nursing. So you try to separate that as po if possible. Okay, Jasmine asks, what strategy should I already implement for my seven week old baby to ensure healthy habits? Okay. So seven week old um, in terms of sleeping, I think like what you can do already is placing the child to bed when they are look drowsy, but they're still, um, I think that's, that's a good way so that they learn that the bed is there for them to sleep, um, that you try not to let them fall asleep while nursing, but I don't know, this is a little bit difficult because often they fall asleep, but just to try, like I mentioned with a, a prior question to try to separate that, um, having a, a regular schedule, putting in a pajama, reading a story. Um, I think to introduce these, this even like even a little baby, you can already start these things, which are nice for for the family and for the baby. Okay. Trisha asks, if we're using the cry it out method, should it be applied equally to both bedtime and naps? Should it be a five week? Sorry, can you repeat? Should it be applied equally to both bedtime and naps? Okay. Um, so the cry, that's, yeah, it's a good question in terms of um, when to apply, which techniques, uh, what time and when. The idea we use is to teach um, falling asleep by themselves. The sleep onset association is really the bedtime um, because that's where they learn, I'm sleepy, I wanna fall asleep. Um, and that hopefully translates to other sleep times as well, meaning to the nighttime sleeping, nighttime awakenings and nap time as well. I think to put the energy at that time is good. Um, in theory, yes, for nap, the same should be used um, if, if it can be done. But I think it's sometimes difficult because nap time you have working at home or, or it's just easier to walk around with a stroller. Um, so the answer, is yes, however, I feel like if you put your energy, it's okay to just do it in the evening um, and to train the child at that time. Great. 
Um, Asina asks, is it possible to discuss how best to approach naps? My six month old sleeps through the night for 10 to 11 hours, but can't fall asleep or stay asleep from naps on their own. Mm -hmm. So each time has, each child has a little bit different nap um, habits. Um, some children like to nap when they're little every two hours or so, one and a half to two hours, they take short naps. And then other children like to do it two bigger naps throughout the day. So everybody is a little bit different. Um, so I think it's good to find cues like when your child is sleepy and when is the best time for that. I don't think um, every child naps a little bit different in that sense. Um, nap time doesn't affect. So when the children are little below two, three years of age, um, they can nap as much as they want in the day. They still have a good night's sleep. Uh, when you get older, that's when you want to be aware that a nap can interfere with nighttime sleep. Um, I think it's just, I don't know, usually children still would take at six months a nap, one or nap a day. Maybe it's just the timing when, when to find a better time when the child is more sleepy. Okay, we have another question. My seven-week-old sleeps poorly during the day and better at night. She only sleeps on my chest and after a lot of rocking, but I can't put her down. Is there anything I can do to help her sleep in the bassinet during the day? So I think if, if you're able to start um, the bassinet sleeping at nighttime, um, you should try if that works. Uh, we know that she is able to fall asleep in a bassinet. It would be good to try it then in this uh, situation also in the daytime and, and let it cry it out if necessary. Um, because we know she can do it. I think that would be encouraging. I think as soon as the pr problem is here, maybe that she is uh, used now to the, the comfort of rocking. And that will, unfortunately, we, you know, that should be as not associated with sleep anymore. Okay, we have two questions from Alex. The first is just clarification. You said that the ideal bedtime is 7 to 7.30, but the slides at 7 to 8.30. So can you clarify which one is the ideal bedtime? And then I'll move on to the second question. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, 7 to 8.30, yes. Okay, great. Um, and the second question is more specific. Alex asks, our daughter is four months next week and she generally does well at night. Right now she's in a stage where she's napping for about 30 to 45 minutes and then typically won't fall back asleep unless she's in her arms. Uh, We've been entertaining this for now, but are there any specific strategies we should start adopting now to help her sleep through an entire nap? Yeah, yeah, I understand. And there's not so much literature out there, honestly, about nap training. Uh, I, I, there, I know there are some questions um, coming from you and the, There is, like I said, everybody is a little bit different in nap. If, if the child, she's sleeping 45 minutes and that's her time, I think that's okay uh, and to go by. I think to enforce uh, more sleep in a day, it might be difficult um, because there's such a variability. But uh, again, there is not too much information out there how to nap train. Uh, the, uh, the focus is really always on the bedtime. Nicole asks about travel. So is it better to get the child adjusted to the new time zone like adults or to try to stick to the home time zone and do that gradually? Okay. So um, when you are, it depends on for how long you're gone. If it's really just, let's say a two, two day trip, um, then remaining with the old time is better. But as long as you, if you stay longer than three, four days, um, it's worthwhile making adjustment. Um, sometimes what we can do is already before we travel into the zone to start um, putting the bed, child to bed either earlier or later to try to adjust that and preparation for the travel. The same is sometimes done for when we change the clock. Um, yeah, but the, the biggest cues are for us to be awake is really the social life and light and day, night and day. So I think when you travel to a different time zone, I think that's it's really hard. Um, it's, if, it's, if you stay longer, you have to adjust over time, yes. Natalia asks, um, my daughter gets up once in the night now, but she gets into our bed. We've been letting it happen because it's so much easier than trying to put her back to bed in her own bed. 
uh, but we're about to have a new baby and I'm not sure how we're going to break the habit. Do you have any advice? Okay. Yeah. So if, if this is, a, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I didn't talk about it at all, but that's good. So one strategy um, for children who like to come to the parent bed at night is to um, teach them when they are allowed to come and when it's not okay to come yet. And that can be done with a nightlight. Um, so that helps the child to know when is it night and when is it day. So let's say you are okay for the child, for your daughter to come at 5 a.m., then you can teach her that by this nightlight. Um, uh, to how it's practically done, let's say you're using already a nightlight, um, you can teach the light, the child, okay, now the light is on, that means it's nighttime, you have to sleep. And once the child uh, light turns off, you can come to our bedroom. And once the child learns that, um, then she can know that let's say at 2 a.m. it's not okay to come yet to the bed, but if it's 5 a.m. and the light is off, she knows how to come. So this is the idea. I mean, I guess you really, there are, we, we can talk about that individually, how to set up the schedule, but that's the idea about it, um, that you, you, you teach the child when is it okay and when to come and when not to come. And the best is with a cue with the night light which is either on or off. So they understand, is it okay or not okay? I wanted to pop on, this is a conversation we hear a lot, probably at 20 months. We hear my kid is waking up at 5 a.m. How do I extinguish that? My husband, my kids did this. My husband wanted to start a cafe that started at five in the morning so you could let somebody, you know, your partner could sleep and you could go somewhere because your kid would get up at 5 a.m. Is that just something about their brains? Can you talk a little bit about that? And, um, and for that first, I have another question too. Okay. Um, so I, yeah, some children, they wake up early because um, it depends if it is, if the child wakes up multiple times a night and then wakes up early and that time that's the last arousal, they just stay awake. Or if the child has a great sleep, sleeps there is eight hours, 10 hours, and then wakes up at five. So I think in that case, if the child is a good sleeper, but just has this early time, what you can do is again, use the night light to say it's 5 a.m. The night is light is not, is still not on or off either way you do it. So the light is still off, so you can't get up yet. You can do something quiet in your bedroom um, to try to teach them like that, um, how to stay in bed quiet by themselves for a little, little bit longer um, because they don't know if it's 5 a.m. or 7 a.m. It doesn't matter, right? They're just up and awake, but they can also, you can try to teach them when it's okay to look for parent attention. I, I do have to say now that I have an 18 and a 20, 20 year old, they, I miss those 5 a.m. trips to Harmony Playground. And so in all of these things, you know, we had, we had our kids crawl into bed with us and now I miss it. And so I, kind of the other side as a parent was, is, am I getting enough sleep? Mm -hmm. And if I'm not getting enough sleep, you know, if they're getting enough sleep and I'm getting enough sleep, is it okay to have and that, yeah. that 5 a.m. wake up maybe happened for three weeks and then it was gone. Then yeah. they started sleeping. And, and, and as I like to tell people, everything is a phase, even the good things. Yeah. No, it's, it's good. Thank you for bringing that up because um, it not, certain things might not be a problem. It's just nice and enjoyable. And, um, you know, the chum, some, some parents have different... Uh, some ch children sleep well when they're rocked to sleep and then sleep all well all night so that's not a problem then necessarily or some children are okay with their little bottle of milk and then they sleep the rest of the night or for some families it's okay to co-sleep and nobody has a so I think it's not there's nothing right or wrong it really depends more on how you feel like we are you're all sleeping and and getting your night sleep the child and the parents so certain behaviors might not be problematic at all and it's just okay I think that's also important to know there's nothing wrong with certain things <laughs> um I don't know it's interesting what you're saying now we have our cat meowing at 6 a.m I'm like oh my goodness I have to start it all over again <laughs> 
Um, to that end, you mentioned co-sleeping and SIDS much earlier. And I know there's still a lot of cultures that do co-sleep and there are, um, you know, what do you feel, and maybe you can't dissect this from your role as a, as a, uh, an expert, but is there any time that co-sleeping is okay? So the vulnerable period for, for SIDS is two to six months of age, uh, up to one year even. So I, I would really not recommend co-sleeping in that time um, because we are worried about suffocation of the child. Um, and um, the, the situation with co-sleeping is that um, their, their beds, their pillows, their parents, their backs, so there are situation where, where uh, anything could, so accidental suffocation can happen. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't recommend for it before at one year of age. Thank you for that, Dr. Panzer. Uh, so there's another question here. How important is a day schedule for nighttime sleep? Should, could could wake-ups be due to a bad schedule or really just sleep associations? Um, so, so in general, um, because I showed you this picture with a girl with a night schedule and day schedule, it is for kids to learn uh, schedule, for kids to learn to attend to a schedule, it's like a helpful thing. Um, the more, I mean, we, we like to, for our kids to be free and do what they want and feel creative too, but sometimes a schedule is really helpful for them to know what to expect. So if a child has a day schedule as well, it is helpful for them to translate to night schedule as well. Um, I'm not so sure if you're referring more like what activities the child should do. So I think one important thing is, yes, the child should be out and about and active and so to sleep better. And another point is also if the child has a lot of rest and gets enough naps in the day, that's also helpful because they sleep better at night. So I'm, I'm not so sure if I was answering the question in the right way. I think that that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so here's another question. Um, our pediatrician said to begin moving our then three month old out of the swaddle. He is not rolling yet. We are now at four months and still working on it. We have not been able to get him to sleep fully apart from some kind of swaddle. Other parents have noted that they kept their babies in swaddles until six months um, and when babies are truly rolling. Are we just causing ourselves more misery by this early adjustment or, or are we getting ahead of it and it will all even out? Okay, um, I, I mean, sw the concern about swaddling are more in very little ones that there is, you know, that they are too tight and they cannot move the arms, um, that there might be, you know, if there's too much swaddling, too much blankets, there's a risk of suffocation, that's one concern. And then the later concern is that the child cannot move freely. But I feel like at some point the child is, um, is able to remove the swaddle in a way that they have enough to room to wiggle and to move about. Um, the idea is once they are removing the swaddle, it shouldn't, it's better not to have it so it doesn't cause a blanket to lying around in the, in the, in the crib. I don't know, I, I'm not so sure how strict you have to be if, if, if everything is going um, well and the child is sleeping okay. I don't think there's a major concern. I think one concern is just the, that the blanket becomes loose and could cause um, some obstruction. Thank you. Uh, so there's a, there's a question for clarification on daylight savings time. So we are springing forward on Saturday at like 2 a.m. Oh do God, we do, do we start putting them to bed earlier or later? Okay, <laughs> now you got me. So it um, so you you can start if your child is a good sleeper. I I wouldn't worry. I mean, usually it's just with the next three days. There's slow adjustments and everything. Everybody moves together in the same direction. Yeah. I think if, if it's really problematic, you can start anticipating the time already. Um, but otherwise, I would just, um, yeah, go, go with the light changes and it, give it a few. It usually takes a week to adjust. Thank you. But yeah, if, well, but so let normal, me just, yeah, no, so if normal bedtime now is at 8 p.m., 
we're springing forward. So it'll be, they'll be sleepier earlier, right? They'll start being sleepy at 7 p.m., right? Mm -hmm. So exactly. you need to push it forward by no. putting them to bed later? So you can make adjustments by 15 minutes or so. And that's the idea, not just to do like the whole hour at once, but just like, um, you know, 15 minutes each day or 10 minutes, something like that. So it's like a slow, slow adjustment. That makes sense. Later. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, apologies if this was already covered, but our nearly six months old can't seem to sleep beyond 10 and a half hours a night. Is this acceptable so, since the norm seems to be 11 or 12? Or I think that you had covered that there's a combination that works, right? Between daytime sleep and nighttime sleep. Yeah, I think, um, so if you have a child who sleeps for 10 and a half hours, I think that's great. Um, I wouldn't stick too much to the limits, what should be, what shouldn't be, because when the child, when she sleeps well and wakes up and is happy and awake, this is, this is okay. Um, yeah. Great. I think oh, that we, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I want to go, I want to go ahead and ask one question because after 20 years, I see this come up all of the time, which is sleep regressions. And so people are like, my kid was sleeping great. Now they're not sleeping great anymore. Are there, are, are there like little sleep regression here at seven, eight months sleep regression? Is there, are there things that people that are on the group that may have a two month old go, oh, okay, that's going to happen. That may happen. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Are there, are there specific ones that you can tell us about? Okay. So, I mean, what sleep regression is more a description, I think, of bumps which are happening along the road. It's not as pathology as such. It is, um, for example, the child is teething. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of pain involved, a little bit more mucus, so that that's a little challenge. So the child might worse, sleep worse again. Then the child developmentally will might want a more independence. Um, is more alert what's happening. So it's more like the child's development or the child's like little pains or little illnesses, which are interfering with, with the sleep um, as such. So um, it's not like a, the regression is more an explanation of what's going on in the other, uh, in the life. Yeah. Okay, great. Lauren, Dr. Panzer, this has been great. Do you have any idea how excited I am that I don't have to worry about this anymore? And telling everybody here, there will be a time where your kids will sleep through the night. And I know after being sleep deprived through two kids that it can be really, really hard. And to really, I had a friend whose husband said, go, go. And she'd go to a hotel and sleep through the night and let let her husband take care of the feeding and the sleeping. And so self-care in this is really important because, you know, I, I say that, you know, sleep, sleep deprivation is a torture tactic in war. And that's what new parents are having to go through in these uh, first six months sometimes. And um, I, 23 months, I wish I would have done things a little bit different and self-soothing is a great thing. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Panzer, thank you so much. Lauren, um, put in the chat to get appointments if you're feeling like you need extra help. And uh, any last thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much. It was, it was great talking to everybody, even though I didn't see you. Um, I mean, yeah, like you mentioned, it's like so much pressure on what we should do, what we shouldn't do as parents. And I think it's it's um, what I try to explain or help is like to find a way that it works for everybody and you don't feel bad about um, what you're doing or have wrong expectations in your child. Um, these are just some, some, some tricks and some ideas um, how to help the child fall asleep and also have to, you know, like a, a good, good family dynamic as well. Excellent. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you. And Thank you very much. Uh, stay tuned for more uh, collaborative programming from Park Slope Parents and New York Presbyterian Brooklyn Methodist Hospital. Excellent. Thanks. Have a great Good Friday. Weekend. It's beautiful out. Go wear your kids out so they sleep well. Go get some <laughs> exercise. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.